T distribution, and we were choosing we were choosing a confidence interval. Okay, so if we want the 95th percentile, I think was the uh, the scenario that we uh, finished with yesterday in class. Um, if we want to determine what the T value in our confidence interval has to be, uh, this is the approach that we use with a chart. Okay, and most charts are this way. And in your homework, if they ask you a question in regards to a chart like this, they have it embedded. You just hit the button, and it pops up this identical chart. Okay, um, basically what you do: degrees of freedom. You choose that by n minus one. So if your sample is ten, subtract one from it. That's where I got nine. We choose the ninety-fifth. Uh, percentile, okay, and when we look at those two rows and columns, their intersection, then is the T-score that we are going to use inside that formula right there to find an estimate for the mean of the population when we do not know the standard deviation of the population and the sample size is small, okay, and specifically less than 30. Um, so that's going to go there. This S is the sample standard deviation, okay, and N obviously is the sample size. If we can do those things, um, we should be able to develop a confidence interval for our population mean, all right? So I want to just go back to this table real quick and show you, because I know some people, uh, They've been asking, can I do this without a table? You can. Um, some of the procedures, technology-wise, software-wise, is not always direct in regards to what the table is. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is when we are using that table, what we're finding out is if we've got this T distribution, okay, and we are trying to approximate this value uh, mu, okay, which is the population mean, because we want to, that, that would be a point estimate. If I just said, you know, it's, um, you know, the average is 85.1, okay, that's a point estimate, okay, but if I say that the average is somewhere between 70 and 90, that's an interval estimate, right, okay, so we want a 95%, um, confidence that our interval is going to contain this value. So what we do is say we're going to work that direction and find half of the area to the right of mu that will contribute to 95% of the area. Okay. Then we're going to work that way. Okay. So we're going to look for what 47 and a half percent this direction, 47 and a half that direction. Does that make sense? And that should give me my central 95%, okay? That is what this table is providing for us. And what the two point, I think the 2.262 number that we gained from the table, remember degrees of freedom here was nine, okay? 95% confidence level. That 2.262 is going to be that T value that kind of stops the area. It, it's the... Uh, location that, um, I guess the demarcation line for that upper 47.5%, okay? Because the T distribution is symmetric, that number right there is the opposite, okay? And that can get pulled out of the table very directly, okay? Now, if you're going to use your technology, technology is a little bit different. So I'm going to use the TIA384 first. I'm not a big fan of any of these um, because of the difference between what we understand with the chart and how we have to type things in in the, in the calculator. Uh, but you can, I mean, they're easy to use once you understand the difference. I'm going to hit second, come down to where it says VARs, and that's going to take you to the distribution um, category, and we are looking for inverse T. Okay. Now, not all your calculators are going to take, when you hit inverse T, not all your calculators are going to take you to this. Okay. Um, 
They're going. Someone will take you straight to. Let me type in real quick, and we'll go back. And, so once you type that in, type that in, hit paste. It'll take you to this. Okay. Like if you have a like a like one of these. So it's the TI eighty nine, but it was made in like nineteen ninety eight. Okay. If you have one that old, when you hit inverse T, it's going to take you straight to this. And you just say inverse T, it's going to have a parenthesis. Okay. Basically, what we're seeing here is that we have to type in our area first as a decimal, comma, and then degrees of freedom. Okay. And that's the command that you have to use to, to garner the 2.262 number we're looking for. Okay. Now, if I hit enter here, and I've done this intentionally, it does not give me 2.262. So if I want the central 95% with nine degrees of freedom, I don't get what my chart is telling me, okay? So the command is written or programmed differently than what the chart is. The, the command in Excel, when I want the central 95%, what I actually have to type in is what that green area would be, okay? So that green area is incorporating this area down here. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, because it's symmetric, because the, the T distribution is symmetric, this here is 0 0.025, and that area there is 0 0.025. Does that make sense? So instead of typing in 95, when I want the central 95%, okay, I actually need to type in kind of the left tail 97.5%, okay? So I'm gonna, instead of put, putting 0.95 here, I'm going to go back and put 9.75. Still degrees of freedom of 9, hit enter, and then you get the 2.262 number that we're looking for, okay? So that's just a little caveat of how... Your TI-84 works differently than just pulling a number off of a table, okay? Um, does that make sense? If you want to use uh, Excel, Excel is the same thing. It's almost the exact same uh, structure in the command. You're going to type in, you know, like equals, and then it's T dot INV. And when you open a parenthesis, it tells you probability. It's cumulative probability now, so it's still 0.975. And then comma, degrees of freedom, and it will give you the same 2.262. Okay. So, again, that's T dot inverse, and then it's probability cumulative comma, degrees of freedom, okay? You can do it in Desmos. Desmos is kind of a pain in the butt because it's not designed with a direct inverse. So basically, Desmos incorporates all our distributions, cumulative, chi-square, uh, normal, all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have inverse um, commands for each one of those, so it doesn't have an inverse T. It doesn't have an inverse... Uh, T doesn't have an inverse normal, doesn't have an inverse chi-square. It just has an inverse command that you have to call for all CDF functions. So the way you have to do this, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but you type in inverse CDF, okay? And that just commands that whatever distribution that I type in next, whether I type in normal, it will find the inverse of the normal. If I type in T distribution, it will find the inverse of the T distribution. Does that make sense? So I got to type in, so I want the, the inverse of the T distribution. So that command is T dist. This is what I don't like, because the normal distribution we never had, in a normal distribution, you could have put the mean and your standard deviation in this parentheses or just left it blank. Uh, with the T distribution, what goes in that parentheses or set of parentheses is your degrees of freedom. And then you get out of the parentheses, hit comma, and type in then your cumulative area again, okay? So it, it, these are, if you think about from college algebra, they are composite functions. 
So it's saying find the t distribution with degrees of 9 or degrees of freedom of 9, okay? But run that then through an inverse function, okay? So it's ultimately doing t dot i and v like Excel was doing, okay? But it's just structured more algebraic that way. I, I, I probably wouldn't use this one, okay? But it is there if you, if you want it, okay? Um, is that okay? So let's talk about what that 2.262 number is. So if you remember with the normal distribution, okay, if I wanted 95% of the area, I would choose a z-score of 1.96 and negative 1.96. It'll fill that area in, and it'll show me that that is then indeed 95%. Okay, so that area, uh, that is red there, would be 95% of the total area under the normal distribution. Well, if I did the same exact thing with those two numbers, if those were the, uh, the integral stop and integral uh, start for the area under a T distribution, okay, I'm not getting 95%. So here, I'd be saying, essentially, if I use those values, the accuracy that I would be, or the confidence in, in my result being accurate would be only be 70% here, okay? If I were to use those two values of negative 1.96 and 1.96. Does that make sense? So what that's going to do is it's going to narrow, if I use 1.96 as uh, the value in this formula right here, okay? It's going to narrow my interval Okay, that estimates mu, but the narrower my inter or my interval, the less confident I am that mu is actually in that interval. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so the way we can widen that then is that we have to change these values. So if I change them to two point two six two, be negative. And positive two point. 262. Okay, now that's a degree of freedom, so that's a sample size of two. So it did widen things a little bit, but because I'm only working with a sample size of two, there's still a lot of variability and I can't be all that confident in my results. So what was our degree of freedom that we wanted? We wanted nine. So now with that 2.262 degrees of freedom of nine, do we see that we get that 95% underneath that curve? Okay, um, so that's that's what those numbers mean. I think when I took stats as um, we didn't have, when I was in, in school, stats was actually part of like uh, college algebra. Like uh, it was pre-calculus called advanced math. In the last kind of maybe month, three weeks of school, they introduced stats. Uh, it wasn't until college that I actually took a legit stats class. Um, these numbers a lot of times were just presented to you. Like, choose, just choose that number off the chart. I'm not going to tell you why, how it comes, what it means, that kind of thing. Uh, and I think you, obviously you can do this. Okay, I think we could teach any, you know, seventh grade, eighth grader to plug things into that formula and re get results, right? But what do those components mean? What does the end result mean? What does the solution mean? Uh, those are things that I think are, are a little bit more important than just being able to Plug and chug, okay? So, um, is everybody okay with that? All right. Do one more example and we'll stop for the day. All right, so this, this says the data, the data represent the number of homes that, uh, or home fires that start by candles, okay? For the past several years. Now, the idea is that, so a, the years are our, Population. Does that make sense? Okay, so when I talk about population, I'm talking about the years. I don't know all of the years that we've had home fires. Does that make sense? I only know maybe the last seven years. Okay, I don't have the data from the entire population. Okay, and when I say the entire population, I'm not talking about all years since like time started. We would say maybe the population is years of the previous 
two decades, three decades, centuries, something like that. Does that make sense? Um, so we would have like a final, uh, like a, uh, an initial start and, and, uh, and a final year. Um, but these seven are from whatever that final or beginning and ending year would be. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so we might, our population might be 100 years, but I've only got these seven pieces of data from that 100 years, okay? So because I only have those seven pieces of data, I don't know anything about the population standard deviation, okay? So this is unknown, okay? And when that is unknown, and in our case, n is equal to 7, which is obviously less than 30, correct? Okay. That yields the use of the T distribution. That's what we have to use. Okay. Now, I just want to show this a couple different ways. Obviously, I've shown you already uh, yesterday, hopefully it's in your notes, the T distribution written out the, the long way as that between statement. Uh, some textbooks are going to write it this way. They will say E, which stands for error, okay? Um, T score, or T value, divided by, or times S divided by root N, okay? That's how we were finding our error, right? Okay, that's the part of the formula right there. Is that okay there, everybody? So then, if I write that, it's a lot easier than to write my between statement and just saying that my between statement is x bar minus e is less than mu is less than x bar plus e. I don't have to write this thing over and over and over again. Does that kind of make sense? So you might see it written both ways. Um, as we work through these problems, I like to identify the things that I'm looking for. So right now, confidence level, they said, was 99%. Okay. It makes sense, I think, to go ahead and find alpha as well. That's the complement. Um, eventually, you know, alpha over 2 obviously is 0 0.005. Maybe you'll need that uh, for dealing with, if you're going to use your calculator, to come up with the, the T-score from that. Um, what's N in this case? How many years of data do we have? We've got seven. So my degrees of freedom would be six, okay? Um, and the problem, two things that we need, T-score of that 99%, and we also need S, which is sample standard deviation, and we also need X-bar, our sample mean, okay? We don't have any of those three things right now. Okay, so we need to go through and if we read the scenario, nothing in the scenario explicitly gives me that information, okay? It's usually called process data. If I go back up to this question that we did yesterday with the, uh, the right tire of cars and measuring their uh, tread depth, the mean right here, they told us of these 10 cars was 0.32. That's process data. That means they already took the 10 values Add them together, divided by 10, and got that number right there, right? 0 0.08 is a processed standard deviation. They already went through the formula and gave you the result of 0 0.08, okay? So a lot of times we get that if we're not privy to the actual raw data. But if they have access to the raw data, like we do here, they usually don't provide you with the process data, and you have to come up with that, right? So here's where, in the past, I've been trying to urge you to use and develop somewhat of a um, understanding of Desmo, or not Desmo, Excel. My mouse died again. All right, there we go. Um, so the reason for that, the reason I've tried to urge you to use Excel is because I don't want to spend, and hopefully you don't want to spend, the amount of time that's going to, require to find the average, which I find the average would not be difficult here. Uh, but then you have to find the standard deviation, which remember would be taking the average and subtracting each one of these numbers, squaring it, adding them all up, and then dividing by n minus one, and then squaring that sum, right? We don't want to do that. That process of finding the standard deviation would probably take twice as long, especially when n gets larger and larger. 
it would probably take twice to three times as long as this entire problem should take us by itself. Does that make sense? So I want you to use Excel to garner that information. My suggestion is what, what I would do is I would just create like a template for Excel. Um, I would let my first column just be the column that I'm going to type in my raw data. Okay, so I'm gonna let that be my raw data column. Okay, and then I would probably want to somehow uh, identify what these values over here in the, the, the next column are gonna be. So I'm just gonna write uh, sample mean, and we'll put that there in that box, and then skip one and just put sample standard deviation. And what I would do once we create these formulas is I would save this, put it on my desktop, and then when I get a problem like this in my homework, all I would have to do is change these numbers. And because these formulas that we're going to put in here are going to target these numbers, it will always just instantly give me that once I type the numbers in. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the way we've got to do this is uh, obviously average is the command for finding the mean. Now, if I just highlight these seven then when I get to a homework question and they give me eight pieces of data, well, I'm going to have to augment this, right? Or change this somehow. I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is just say average and then A colon A. And what that does is it highlights the entire column of A. Okay. But the nice thing about it is that it's, only, it's going to basically search through this and it's only going to add up the things that have values in them, the cells that have values in them, and then it's going to count how many of those cells that are highlighted actually had values in it. So it's only going to divide by seven. Does that make sense? Okay. So what that means then is I get to my homework, and there's one that has an eighth object in it. So maybe I got an, an eighth year that has, uh, I'll just say 6,000. I put that in, and you see that it automatically then changed the sample mean for me. Okay. So... Uh, I think that would be useful to do it that way. Sample standard deviation, again, use the command, equals STDEV. Okay, now I've got two options, dot P or dot S. Which one do I use? Dot S. Why dot S? Because it's the sample. Okay, so P would be the population. Okay, and again, I'm just going to use A colon A, and as long as there is a um, set of characters that they, call, they refer to as a string, as long as there is a string in one of these cells, it will get used. If not, it will be neglected. Okay. Um, hit enter, and there's my sample standard deviation. Is that okay? All right. Um, we might spend some time tomorrow maybe building this out even a little bit further because I think uh, we could probably for, or, uh, program this to once we create a T value that we could just plug our T value in and then it automatically gives us our um, confidence interval. Okay, um, But once we have those things, we'll just go back I'll put that to the side, and we'll come back to it in a, minute, in a minute. But we've got sample mean, 7041.43. Sample standard deviation, 1610.27. Now, we don't have the T value yet. Okay? So, however you want to do that, I'm going to use, um, I'll use my TIE3. Okay, so we want the 99%, the central 99%, okay? So again, if I type in 0.99, it's only going to give me, um, basically it's going to give me a T-score that's a little bit smaller than what it should be, okay? Um, so we don't want the central, we, we want the central 99% for an answer, but the area that we have to put in here is the cumulative 
all the way up to that kind of that right boundary of that central 99%. Basically what this number here is, uh, if you want to write this down, that that number you type in there is always the confidence level plus half of alpha or the confidence level plus one tail. Okay. So if my confidence level is 99%, okay, that leaves me 1% left over for both tails. So one tail will be 0 0.005, right? So 99% plus 0 0.005 gives me that. My degrees of freedom would be six in this case. Hit enter. And now we've got our T value, 3.707. 3.707. So, I don't know if you guys, I think some of you probably picked this up from college algebra, uh, but thinking about our, our confidence interval, it's a between statement, but the lower boundary and the upper boundary are identical except for it's x bar minus and it's x bar plus, right? So, we, we have an option. We can either waste our time typing this in multiple times or we can use some of the functions on the calculator to cut and paste. Um, so if we go X bar, which was 70, 41.43 minus, okay, your T value of 3.707 times your standard deviation, 1610.27 divided by the square root of N. N was seven, wasn't it? And then close that off. We have our lower bound now, okay? These calculators, the newer ones, you can then take your directional keys and go up and highlight. If I highlight that line and hit enter, it's gonna cut and paste that and let it be then an editable uh, line for us. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if you don't have one of the newer ones that allows you to use the directional key um, to scroll up, does anybody know how to get that to get pasted down here? Okay, so, so sec, second enter will go through the last 10 things that you have typed in. Um, and you can cycle through those as much as you need to. Um, but now that provides the editable line. Ed editable, not meaning I can eat it, but... Um, then I'm going to, just going to change that to a plus sign, right? And then that's my confidence interval. So 4785, I'm going to round 4785 to 9297, 9298. Okay. So a lot of times, and you're going to see this in Mac Excel, going back to college algebra, algebra two, talking about intervals we can use interval notation that's interval notation right there and that is basically saying that mu the population so if, if there was a hundred years here that was my population i can now be 99 percent confident that when i took those 100 things 100 years of data and add together that their average is going to fall between those two numbers of 4785 and 9298 okay now they might not the 1% chance that they might not, right? But we can now be pretty certain that they will. Does that kind of make sense what's going on there? Um, I'd like to, I'm, I'm trying to figure something out with a, like a scenario um, where maybe we would take like, uh, like take the entire class and, and take some characteristic that each of you have, measure it somehow, and then do like a student T distribution with just a sample, like seven of you and see how that T distribution estimates our mean. Easy. And then use the Z distribution, because then we'd, have, we'd also have the population data, right? Okay. Look at what the population, I, I just got to figure out what size of population we really need to do this with. Um, but then actually do the work with the population and see what the actual population mean is, and you will see, you'll recognize that it is between the interval that was created using the T distribution. Does that kind of make sense? Um, but most scenarios in real life, you can't do that because like, 
in this case, I don't know all those other pieces of data for the rear. Yes? Nostril diameter. Nostril diameter. Yeah. Some of us, we just have to measure them the width of our finger. Yes. Huh. That one wouldn't measure. That's, isn't that like biological? That, that's like a front stripe, though. That's, that's right, right? Like, I, I don't know. That's the way you were like, in DNA. Like, 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 what? Is the same like, as your form. Huh? Yeah. yeah. I think it's evolution that your, no, your nostrils have been have grown so that they are the width of your finger, just for easy access. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole works time, 8.2. Uh, it's going to be due uh, next week. Uh, I, don't, I think there's only maybe, maybe eight questions on it.